Well, hello, and welcome to the Unfair Advantage series, where we explore the strategies, insights, and methodologies to give you an unfair advantage. Today's topic is how to develop exceptional leaders. Now, there is a leadership axiom that says that the ceiling on your business growth is limited to your ability to developing exceptional leaders. Why is it so hard to find exceptional leaders? Why is there a shortage? And how do you go about developing exceptional leaders? Well, today's guest is an expert. He's going to answer those questions and many more. Now, I know that there are people in the audience from a variety of industries in senior living and housing, healthcare, wellness, and even technology. And you've heard me say this before, but success leaves clues. So regardless of your industry, we can all learn from the experience and strategies that are being used in other industries. So excited to introduce you to our guest today. Our special guest is Gus Savlov. He's a vice president of IMD EMR Healthcare Systems. IMD EMR has been named to the Inc.'s 5,000 fastest growing companies several years in a row. And Gus and his outstanding team of leaders has been driving that entire process of growth. Gus has made it his personal life's mission to find and develop individuals and future exceptional leaders. He is a mentor to many and a trusted advisor to many more, including me. In fact, I met Gus in October of 2014 during a business conference. I was in a difficult place in our business. Gus saw something in us that I couldn't see, and he believed in me when I couldn't believe in myself. I owe so very much to Gus. You have no idea. And I can tell you that everyone I meet who knows Gus would tell you a very similar story. He's one of a rare business leaders and mentors that we can find today. And I'm really overjoyed and excited that he's agreed to share with us today. Thank you so much, Gus. It's such a special blessing to me personally to know you and truly a privilege to have you here today. Thanks for having me, Mona. I'll do my best to, to answer questions and to meet your expectations because you set the bar pretty high. <laughs> I have no in your worries. Introduction. I have no worries, Gus. I know you. So Gus, I know that it's a well-known fact that there's a shortage of exceptional leadership today. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that there is a shortage of exceptional leaders today, not because they're not out there. I think there is a shortage of leaders in general and and just a shortage in in workforce resources for, for many, many reasons. And I think one of the major reasons is distractions. There is not the same level of motivation across society that there used to be social media it could play a big, big part in these distractions. And I think that overall, people have kind of got buried in, in all these different forces that we have out in the marketplace that don't help them realize their true potentials. They, I think people in general, not everybody, but I think there's a large group of people with tremendous talents that have maybe to some extent lost their identity. And by losing their identity, they lose their potential. So I don't think that there's a shortage of exceptional leaders. I think it's harder to find them because you got to go through a lot more to be able to identify who these individuals are. When you were telling me earlier too, that it's an investment to become a leader. It takes work. It takes effort. Yeah, it's absolutely. Look, I think you're right. We had this conversation earlier. And I think that when we talk about people's motivation or lack of, you know, there's a lot of, of let's take the easy road these days, you know, let's make money, you know, on Deutschcoin or on, on, on some of these things that are, you know, yeah, I mean, some people made money in it, but I mean, for the most part, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like, Hey, let's try the easy way out. I hear young people who I mentor all the time. I'm like, you know, so what's your dream? And they'll be like, oh, I'm going to invent an app and I'm going to make a billion dollars. You know, I think it was Mark Cuban. I heard say one time that every single app that needs to be invented has already been invented. But the point is that the easy road is, I don't think it ever works out. I think that in today's society, it's very hard or it's harder to find the people that are willing to do the work. 
Because becoming a leader, reaching your goals, things of that nature requires a certain level of work and motivation and thick skin and being able to sustain things that other people don't want to go through. You know, and, and I think leadership has many different levels to it, but at any level, at any level, when you're in the front of the line, you're always first to get hit with something. Everybody behind you is a little bit sheltered. But again, you know, finding these people are willing to understand what it takes I think is where it becomes more difficult. Is there a shortage? I don't believe that there is a shortage. I believe that there is a shortage because it's harder to get people to understand what their potential is. You know, my dad, and I know we've talked about this in the past. My dad used to say, if it was easy, anybody would do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. You have to be willing to take blows that other people aren't willing to take. It isn't easy. And you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, Mona, you and I have had conversations in the past that I think under circumstances would have been very difficult for somebody who doesn't have those types of motivations to wrap their head around and be able to keep moving forward. So it's not, you know, leadership is not for the faint of heart, but I think you also have to put leadership in perspective. I think one of the things is, you know, we can talk about leaders in the context of business, but, you know, it's just as hard to be a leader in the home. It's just hard to be a leader amongst your friends when you think differently. You know, leadership has many, many facets to it. And I think that people just throughout whatever vertical you're looking at tend to want to take the road of least resistance, the easy way out, as opposed to, you know, maybe looking at certain values, looking at things that line up with what their thought process is. And when you start analyzing it, sometimes going against the grain is not that appealing to people. But I think that I think that leaders are out there. I think they're out there. I think deep down inside they're hungry. It just might be a little bit a little bit more labor intensive to identify that. Right. I, I totally agree with you. I've heard this before and I'd like to get your thoughts on it. It's a kind of a leadership objective that your goal is to mentor. Uh, leaders to the point that they're 80% of you. That's your objective. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we talked about this. I, I, I think it's, it would be nice to get people to be 80% of you if, if you feel that you're all that. But I believe that we should mentor people to be 100% of who they are. That's we good. should help them find their identity find their passions, find their, 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 put them on a, on, on, on a path to, to their dreams, if you will. I know that maybe this might paint some sort of very unrealistic picture, but I'm, I'm an optimist. And I, I believe that when, when we invest in somebody, we need to invest in them for what they're able to accomplish, not because we want to clone them to be us so they can accomplish what we're accomplishing. That's really good. Now, I know, too, that you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You you weren't who you are today. Uh, you didn't grow up just having everything handed to you. Do you mind sharing a little bit about your story and tell us how you became a leader? Who poured into your life? How did that go? Well, I don't know that this that this session we have here is long enough for me to get into specific details. You know, I'm I'm I I would consider myself fortunate. You know, I mean, even though you know I, I can tell you the, the the stories of my parents got divorced and this that and the other, even that I had and have to this day awesome parents who are always there, very supportive, always took the time to to at least give advice. But definitely, definitely, I was I saw that they worked hard and they instilled that ethic. And not just that, I've had just amazing, amazing people all in addition to that in my life, starting with, you know, my my best childhood friend, his dad, who when my dad lived in another country, you know, over here was really stepped in and just an amazing person and and instilled skill sets in us. And I'm not going to get into the the whole story, but this was an amazing individual who who gave me, and I'll say us because any one of our friends that came in contact with this person, you always took a nugget. And to this day, I remember of little things that he said. Um, so throughout my throughout my entire life, there and even when things got really really difficult for me because they did, um, there was always somebody there that encouraged me, that saw something in me, that pushed me, and and I think. All those things put together, you know, help you get ahead. And I think that when that happens to you, I think we have a moral responsibility, a moral responsibility to 
to pay it back or pay it forward or whatever you want you want to call it. I think we do have a moral responsibility to do the same. Was there kind of a point in time in your life that you can look back at and say, at that time, I made a decision or I woke up to the fact that I wanted to be a leader or I was ready to pay the price to do that? Well, I if you ask my parents and you ask me, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate. What I do, I said I was going to do when I was five years old. I knew that this is this is what I want to do. Maybe not how or in what industry or whatever, but I, I always knew that this is this is what I want to do. I want to be in the business realm. I want to want to do this. I'm not. So so for me, you know, is it, it, it was easy. Um, I always say that, you know, for anybody who's in South Florida knows that if you want to go to Orlando to Disney World, you can jump on the turnpike from the east coast of south florida and 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 go straight and in about three hours and change you're in disney world but you can also jump on 95 and go to disney world but that sends you a lot more east and it takes a little bit longer but if you follow that road you're still going to get to disney world it might take you a little bit longer you know i'm pretty stubborn and i think in a lot of cases i always when i had opportunities to travel on the turnpike i went on 95 you know but all that being said for me, it's easy. What I do is what I've always wanted to do. Well, and I would say too, that being stubborn has actually worked in your favor because that's sometimes what gets you through the hard times. And I know that you've been through some hard times and being stubborn is what gave you the tenacity, the grittiness to push through. Yeah. I don't know that my wife would necessarily agree with my stubbornness, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, when I get something in my mind, I'm, I go full force and, and until there is really no opportunity to accomplish it, it doesn't, it doesn't stop. So I, I guess that that could definitely be part of my story, if you will. So, and I would agree with that. And I would agree with your wife as well. But um, in regards to leadership, there are terms that are um, exchanged, manager and leader are terms that are sometimes used synonymously, but what are your thoughts on what is the difference between a manager and a leader? How would you differentiate between them? That's a loaded question because, you know, there is managers who manage people or departments or whatever, and they're great managers. And, and, and they, they lead that small sector of that department. And they do very, very well. They have their, their instructions and they have their processes, policies, and procedures. And, and that's what they do, right? I think leaders who there's a lot of managers who are great leaders, right? Who are, are, I think maybe putting it in perspective, I always say this, like when I'm looking for somebody, I'm looking for an entrepreneur. And when I say an entrepreneur, you know, I think there's a misconception out there that every entrepreneur is a business owner. Um, I think, um, I think great leaders who manage are people with an entrepreneur spirit an entrepreneur mentality. They're not afraid to, to take a risk or come up with a, a plan and present it to their executive team or whatever and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the, I'm, I'm seeing what's going on on the ground and I've come up with this where I think that typical managers run their little sector and they're waiting for instruction. And I think that that might be a, a, a one way to, to, to maybe kind of draw that difference is if we talk about a leader in that same, in that same vein, that leader has an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. They're, they're constantly looking around. They're first to try to resolve a problem. They're not bringing the problem to their superiors and saying, tell me how to solve this. And then I'll go and execute that for you. I think that that might be a, a, a one explanation. I'm sure there's many. But in, in my perspective, that is one of the first things that I, I tend to notice is, hey, do you have the capacity to think down the road here and see what's going on in, in, this, in this realm that you've been put in and see this in time down the road and come up with a solution, come up with a plan, present it, articulate it properly, make a case for it. Um, I think some individuals that come in contact with me that work with us, you know, at IMDMR would say that they'll, they'll call me up or they'll call um, Abdiel, who's um, our CEO up and say, Hey, I have this great idea. It's this, 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 and this, and we'll just shoot it down. 
Some of them take that and say, let me work harder on it. Some of them are like, they don't want to listen to what I have to say. And a lot of times it has to do with the delivery. They didn't articulate it properly. The, 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 the research wasn't done appropriately, the things of that nature. But I think true leaders who have an entrepreneurial spirit are not afraid to have the conversation. And when the conversation doesn't go their way, they're not afraid to come back and continue to have conversations. And I think that that's what I look for. Uh, it's kind of like that iron sharpens iron mentality, right? Keep coming, keep hitting, keep, keep making it better. We'll find, we'll find that, that exact point that we say, wow, here it is. And I think that, that that's what creates success in general. Um, I think it creates those types of successes in marriages and friendships all around. It's relationship. It's relationship. And how much are you willing to put into that relationship? And I think some people don't have that staying power. You know, they just want to do their thing and do it great. And that's a good manager. And there are some people that want to do their thing, do it great, but they see something and they want to they want to bring it to the attention because in their heart, they feel it's going to make things better. Now, it might not bounce their way, but they keep coming. And those are the people that I love. And it goes back to that tenacity, or you could call it stubbornness if you want, that yeah. whole concept that's part of the, the skills or part of the character traits. Yeah. Now, I, you know, we're not talking about somebody who is so, so aggressive that they're disrespectful, but somebody, I want somebody who's aggressive, articulate, thinks things through, presents it in a way that, that you could say, wow, you know, um, you know, I tell a story of, I, and I won't get into detail, but I was in a meeting and there was somebody who spoke. He was from, he was a, a health minister of another country and he spoke about the health system in that country. And I disagreed with probably just about everything that person said. They were so articulate and made such a phenomenal point on why this was what they were doing that I sat there and said, you know, anybody could be convinced that this is a great a great concept. And in fact, after the meeting, I went up to this person. I basically said, hey, you know, this is who I am. I sat through your talk. I want to tell you that I, I'm not in agreement, but I really appreciated your point of view. It gave me a lot to think about. And I think that those are the things that, that we look in, in leaders to being able to identify the good things and the disagreements, right? Because that's how we find that middle ground. Mm -hmm. And you've heard them referred to as thought leaders before too, so because they're thinkers. They don't just yep. swallow whatever is given to them, but they process and think and innovate. So sure. I, I, I love that. I love that. And I think, and, you know, and everybody thinks that it's the VP that's got to do it or the CEO that's got to do it or whatever. And I don't believe that. I believe that the, that the phone operator, if they have that drive, do it so you can get noticed, so you can elevate yourself, you know, so that you can demonstrate that you're more than, than where you started. Nobody wants to start some, somewhere and end where they started. We want them to start somewhere and end somewhere that they never thought they were going to end at. That's what, what I think has to happen for people to trust you, to want to listen to you, to, to want to work with you, to want to even spend time with you. Mm -hmm. The world is hungry for those kind of people. The world is hungry for those who don't settle for the status quo, quo which actually kind of transitions us to the next question, which is today's topic is developing exceptional leaders. So why are exceptional leaders in your mind, why are they needed today in these times that we're living in now? Why exceptional thus? Mona, look, first, the first thing I'm going to say, and, and you know, when we talked a little bit about this presentation and, and some of these, um, buzzwords that we're using here, right? I, I've been kind of playing with it in my head. And I'll say something here. I think people in leadership, I believe, have a responsibility to develop other leaders, right? You kind of keep that going, right? I think the leaders that are being developed, so leaders have the responsibility to develop other leaders. The leader being developed has the responsibility to become exceptional. I don't think that we develop exceptional leaders. I don't think that we look out there for exceptional leaders. I think being exceptional in a leadership position is a self-motivating thing. I can't make somebody exceptional. You can't make somebody exceptional. 
we have to be exceptional in our own way, right? Or work towards that, work towards being exceptional. And the person, if you want to call it who you're grooming, who you're investing in or whatever, has the responsibility to become exceptional. I, I don't think that exceptional is the same for everybody. But why exceptional leaders? I think if, if we ask the question in that context, I think, you know, when you want to be a leader, when you're hungry, when you have that tenacity, when you want to accomplish something, you do it in an exceptional way. And you want to do it better than anybody else. You want to attain, you want to attain, you want to be set, set apart. So why exceptional leaders? Because you want to be set apart. So is it a choice to be exceptional? I, I absolutely believe that it could be a choice. Listen, you could be a leader who is mediocre. You know, you could be a leader that says, you know, I'm a leader. And, and sometimes, sometimes of the month, I'm going to be tenacious and I want to do this when it's maybe self-serving. There's a lot of leaders like that. But then the rest of the time, I'm just going to kind of sit back, enjoy where I'm at. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable. I mean, you know, there, it's not like every leader is not the same. So I think exceptional is a responsibility. I think exceptional is, is an individual. It's an individual perception and motivation. I want to be exceptional in things. Then it's up to me. I don't need somebody to tell me you need to do this so you could be exceptional. I need somebody to tell me, man, I see the potential in you. I know you can do better than you're doing today. I, I, I see this in you. I, I believe in you. I need somebody to, to, to maybe feed me that encouragement. And I need to take that and say, okay, how do I become exceptional? I guess you could, you could almost take any athlete. Any athlete is basically told, man, you have the goods to be professional. You, you could be a professional football player. You know, they give them a, a scholarship to college. They do this. They get trained. They go to training camp. They have their trainers. They have all this stuff, right? Now, becoming exceptional at their sport is their responsibility. How hard are they going to work? Are they going to, mm. you know, work through an injury? Are they, nobody makes them exceptional. Mm. They're given skill sets. They're giving this. They're given that. They refine them. So I think becoming exceptional as a leader is the leader taking it upon themselves to refine their skill. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my opinion. On and that. the effort they're willing to put in is what I hear you saying. It's all about effort. It's all about effort. Listen, you can't become exceptional sitting around. Now you can become an exceptional sitter, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's 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 just one of those things. It's so individualized and it's so personal. But from that perspective, I think becoming an exceptional leader, the exceptional part is that person's responsibility. It's nobody else's responsibility. I don't have a responsibility to make somebody exceptional. I have the responsibility maybe to identify something in somebody that they didn't see, but what they do with it, that's up to them. That's so good. Really speaks to personal responsibility, personal accountability. And at the end of the day, you're right. You can give them all the resources in the world, but if they're not willing to put in the blood, sweat, and tears, it's not going to happen, which is actually, again, another good segue to the next questions. So can anyone be groomed to be exceptional? And if not, what are some of the traits that you're looking for in an exceptional leader candidate? So I know you've kind of touched on some of that, but is there anything else you want to add to that? Well, I know that my ultimate optimism always, always comes, comes in these cases. You know, I, I, I tend to, and I've been accused of this. I tend to, to, to try to see the best in everybody. And, and, and sometimes it's, it's, it could be one of my, my flaws, you know, but can anyone be an exception, exceptional leader? I, I believe anybody who, who, who wants it can do it. I believe anybody who sets their mind to something can achieve it. I don't believe in holding people back. I believe in, in raising people. I always say that we need to raise people, uh, managers, so that they work themselves out of a job. That means that they're moving in into the next level. I believe that we should be stepping stones for the people that we mentor. And, and I will say to you, Mona, that can anyone be an exceptional leader? I think they can. I think the number one thing that I see with especially young people that I've come in contact with and especially those who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds and you know I've told you a million times that I believe that our greatest entrepreneurs come from our disadvantaged communities I'm a true believer in that I believe that there's an innate skill set that comes along with having to experience certain things that others who are not in in difficult circumstances get to experience 
but I will also I'll also tell you that when people decide that their circumstances don't become their identity, that they need to find who they are and what their potential is, then at that point, anybody could be an exceptional leader. I think that as long as there's some sort of pity party going on because you went through this and you went through that, it's it's unfortunately, and, and again, obviously people go through difficult situations, it's very hard to overcome. I, I'm extremely sympathetic to that, but it becomes a barrier for somebody to see down the road some of their potentials. I think we have a responsibility to demonstrate it to them, but anybody who puts their mind to it, I think can be exceptional in what their capacity is, right? The exceptional leaders, you know, what are you leading in? You could be an exceptional leader in your in your household and, and a great employee at your job. And I think then if that's your capacity, then you're an exceptional leader. So so again, you know, in the business realm, you know, I, I, I think that anybody who's hungry, who set their mind to something, who, who, who has a vision, it really does mean you need to be able to see something yourself so that you could become exceptional. That's your personal responsibility. I think, I don't know that anyone could become an exceptional leader, but, but, but I believe everybody should work towards it. So I was going to ask you what traits you're looking for, but what I, what I heard you say, I, I really want to kind of point out, which is that difficult times can either work for you or against you, depending on how you decide to handle them. So and I think could, it's all personal, personal decisions. Yeah. So they could be a barrier for you if you let that become your identity, or it can be a breeding ground for leadership if you choose a different identity. Is that what you were kind of saying? Or No, maybe that is what I'm saying. All, all I'm saying is that people in general, if they want to accomplish something, um, you know, Mona, how many times have you and I had this conversation? You know, I say when people want to accomplish something, you have to do inventory, inventory of yourself, where you are, what you want, all that kind of stuff. And then based on that, then, you know, you have to, I think a person needs to set their goals. Now, in setting those goals, obviously, it's great when you have somebody, a mentor, a sounding board, somebody who's willing to invest in you, right, to get you there. But I think that at some point, an individual has to see what they want and start on that path, regardless of where they came from. And I, I know that it's it's harder for some than 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 for others, but I, I think it doesn't change the fact that that's how it should start. Oh, I love that. So let's kind of take a little bit of a turn and talk about the dark side. And I know you've been there. I've been there as well. But you know, what about when you groom someone and you pour into them and, as you say, invest <coughs> to leaders and, and then they leave you? What's the right perspective? I know you have a very healthy approach to developing someone who goes on to do something different and leaves you. I haven't been quite as healthy in it, in my approach, but I'd like for our audience to hear how you view that. I think that, you know, that's, that's a very broad based question because, you know, are they leaving you because, you know, you thought you're investing in them and then they're just not happy with your methodologies, uh, chemistry, whatever. But I, I think from a positive perspective, I think when you groom somebody and they leave you for something better and they're doing better and better, and I can, I can introduce you to examples of this. And, you know, I've always said, if you are investing in that person and they move on to bigger and better things, and you had 0.001% to do with their overall success, I think that you should be proud. I think you should be proud. I think that when you're investing into somebody, when you're grooming somebody, when you're, when you want to see somebody do better, you know, it's a commitment to that person. It's an understanding that you're doing it because you want them to do better. And most of all, I think that it requires uh, for us to put our egos aside, to put our own personal agendas aside and, and see what's best for that person. And if that person is, is moving on to bigger and better things, especially bigger and better things that let's say your organization couldn't offer them, I don't believe in, in, in keeping people down and holding them back. Personally, I would probably fire somebody for them to do better than to keep them at their peril. I'm a strong believer in that. I'm a strong believer in that. And I think, I think overall that builds great relationships 
down the road. That person can can go somewhere and get into a position that actually would benefit you more because all of a sudden they're somewhere, maybe at a company that you've been trying to have a relationship with and you couldn't. Now they're in a position where where you can have that, right? So I think it always comes full circle. There's always dots that you can connect. Personally, in those situations, it actually makes me happy. It makes me happy to see people get better and better. I smile when you say that you would fire someone in order to force them to go into uh, the next level of their career that you groomed, because I know for a fact you've talked about that in the past. And I know, and you know, and you know what, Mona, let me tell you something. And the reason why you, you have to do that is because if not your, so what I'm going to use, maybe you're kind of like a hypocrite to yourself if you don't, because if you commit to developing somebody, to demonstrating their potential, and the day comes that they have that opportunity of a lifetime and you stand in the way, then you wasted your own time or you did it for a selfish reason that would make it would make it kind of a waste, if you will. If you commit, you commit. You know, it's kind of like for better and worse or worse, right? When you commit, you commit. And, and you need to be invested in that person so that when that opportunity comes up, you can celebrate it with them. Mm, that's so good. So if, if you're a leader and you want to develop exceptional leaders and that is your heart, what are some of the components or ingredients or the secret sauce? I know you don't really use that word. I've heard you use the term relationship over and over and over again, and you use that a lot. So what are some of the uh, keys to developing leaders in your, in your experience? And Well, I think, that, I think that a lot of people that know me know that in certain things, I'm very impatient. But when I see somebody that has potential, I'm, I'm, I become very patient. I think that when you're developing anybody, you have to commit because you have to have that relationship because when you're giving somebody information, advice, direction, whatever you want to call it, there's a trust factor. Mm -hmm. You want them to trust you. A lot of people that you find that you want to develop have had maybe negative experiences with other managers or with other businesses or whatever, and you run the risk of having to pay the price for what the wrongs that somebody else did to them. So you want them to trust you. You want them to know that you have their best interest at heart. You want them to know that, that you see something in them and you want to get them there. No, a lot of the work is on them, not on you, but you have to set that, that expectation and that, that foundation in order to be able to be able to do it. Um, and and it, I don't have a secret sauce. I think it's just patience, commitment, understanding that this is not an overnight process. You're breaking down habits, you're showing new perspectives, you're, you're changing point of view of how they see leadership, all these things. It's, it's a big combination of things. Um, you know, Mona, I think I, I told you to me, developing a good leader is like, is like slow cooking a good meal. You got to slow cook it because it's going to really taste good at the end. And, you know, when you're slow cooking something, you really, really want to get into that meal, but you got to wait, you got to wait until, until it's perfect. And I think that that's kind of, it is, I, I think in my mind, you know, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but, but that's how I feel, but that's just me. That's just how I see things. I see people with potential as, as, as a work that needs to be done. It's not something that happens quick, but I tell you what, when it does happen and when they do hit their goals and when you see that change, I think that's where we need to kind of be extremely proud, not just of ourselves, but of them for taking that initiative and going down that road. Well, to play off of your slow cooker analogy, I think the proof is in the pudding. I know it's a bad pun, but I had to go there. You have so many people, Gus, and I'm not just saying this because you're on the call today. Every single person that I've met or you've introduced me to, they all have the same story about how you've mentored them, how you've believed in them, how you've challenged them, how you've pushed them to be the better, best person they could be, whether that was as an individual or as a leader, leader. 
and it ha- it does take time. You uh, can't undersell what you've done because, and you continue to do. I know people right now that you're pouring into, a- again, including me. So I think that uh, a lot of it is just because of your relationship and people know your heart. And I feel like y- you can't really pour into someone or challenge them until they know that you have their best interests at heart. And for you, that's always the case. Well, I appreciate it you saying that Mona, I don't know. Um, you know, you know me, I don't, I don't take these types of, uh, comments easily. Cause I don't like, I know, that I know stuff, that, but I but, like to watch but, you squirm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're doing a, a good job. Um, but, but I, I I'll say this to you. I, I do believe that when I see somebody that I'm interested in from this perspective, I guess I would say, it is a labor of love. And when I mean it's a labor of love, I think it's the love that I have to see somebody do great. I think we have way too many examples of today of, of people not doing great. And, you know, we just have to do our little piece and put those seeds out there and contribute our little piece. And hopefully others are doing the same. And, and then overall, things become better and better. And again, I know that that's the optimist in me and I'd like to keep it that way, but it is a labor of love. You know, it is a labor of love and it is, it is a a beautiful thing when I, when I see people start to, to move in a direction that makes them happy. Yeah. You definitely are an optimist, Gus, but don't wake you up. It's working for you. (laughs) So one final question, and I know you've touched on a lot of things today, but If you had like one parting word, one final advice for developing exceptional leaders, is there anything you want to make sure that the audience remembers today? And I think this is a replay type of episode, but one final piece of advice, Gus. Look, my my advice is very simple, is commit, be patient, and, and be understanding of the other person's background experiences and understand that anytime you develop anybody, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to, they're going to get frustrated. They're going to question the whys, right? And, you know, I know that in business, this might not be appropriate, but I have a mentor of mine that said, you know, always start with love and kindness. And I know that sometimes in business, we need to be shrewd and we need to be a lot more aggressive and you find those moments, right? But when you want somebody to kind of understand your perspective, then I think if you're doing, if you're coming at them from a kind place, maybe more of a vulnerable place, I think, I think a lot of times there'll be that aha moment. I understand why he's saying this. I understand why he's showing this to me. And so that's my advice. My advice is patience, commitment, understanding. And I think when, when you do that, people tend to be enthusiastic in the things that you're proposing. That's very good advice. That's, it's wisdom. And I appreciate that. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, I think this is one of those episodes that we need to watch over and over again, because there are di- different stages in our careers and our life and our maturity and our leadership that what you said applies. So it's one of those things where you need to hear it over and over again. So I encourage our audience to put this on replay, if you will. And I want to thank you, Gus. I just, um, as I, I've already kind of told you how much I appreciate you, but it, it bears repeating. And I'm so grateful that you are willing to come on this. I know that you um, act like you're shy in front of an audience, but I also know you and I know your wisdom. And I'm so grateful you were able to give us some time. If you'd like to get a hold of Gus, that is his website, the company. You can also follow him on LinkedIn. If you'd like to reach us at uh, Unfair Advantage or Advantage Anywhere, our contact information is on the screen as well. We are so happy that you were able to join us. I hope you got half as much out of today as I did. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Unfair Advantage. Thanks again and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, you, Gus. Bye-bye.